served for none but a few. That's elementary, my dear Watson. Almost instantaneous death, presumably. Mm. Straight through the heart. Is this Mrs. Cubitt's handbag? Yes, it is, Mr. Holmes. At least 20, 50 pound notes. A bribe that failed. So, two bullets fired, two wounds inflicted, as you said. Yes, Doctor. Then how do you account for the bullet that has so obviously struck the window frame? By George, however did you see that? Because, Dr. Carthew, I looked for it. Wonderful. Why, the, the bullet's still there. So a third shot must have been fired. Which means that a third person must have been present. Exactly. Every day, thousands of postage stamps pass through the mail. Tiny, perforated portraits to honor some of the world's greatest heroes. Some are born to success. Others have it thrust upon them. This is the story behind one man's stamp of greatness. When Sir Arthur Conan Doyle invented Sherlock Holmes, he created a new kind of detective. A scientific consultant to whom even the police could turn for help. The skills which Sherlock Holmes practiced so successfully in fiction were later adopted by the police as new techniques. The differentiation of tobacco ashes, the use of plaster casts, the analysis of dust. Sherlock Holmes was a detective ahead of his time and in many ways mirrored his creator Conan Doyle. The England of Doyle's boyhood was the world of Sherlock Holmes. In the fog-enshrouded streets of the East End of London, Jack the Ripper stalked his victims one by one. It was a country of social extremes, where privilege and prosperity existed side by side with poverty and violence. People wanted Sherlock Holmes to be real. They wanted to believe that someone could counteract the real crime and violence of the streets, which the police force seemed so hard-pressed to control. Doyle's ideas about a scientific approach to detection had all started at Edinburgh University in the 1870s when he was a young medical student. One of his professors was Dr. Joe Bell, an expert at deductive observation. When a new patient first walked into his consulting room, Bell would not only diagnose the disease, but also very often his occupation and background as well. You served in the army. Aye, sir. Not long discharged. Who is that? A Highland Regiment? Aye, sir. A non-com officer? Aye, sir. Stationed in Barbados? Aye, sir. You see, this man is a respectful man, but he did not remove his hat. They do not do that in the army. But he would have learned civilian ways had he been long discharged. He has an air of authority and is obviously Scottish. As to Barbados, his complaint is elephantitis which is West Indian and not British. Once qualified, Doyle set up in general practice. But patients were few, and so he began to write. In an early newsreel interview, he explained how Professor Bell influenced the creation of Sherlock Holmes. I used occasionally to read detective stories. It all annoyed me how in the old-fashioned detective story, the detective always seemed to get at his results either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. Well, if a scientific man like Bell was to come into the detective business, he wouldn't do these things by chance. And uh, from that time, Sherlock Holmes fairly prospered, and so I may say did I, and so it is that this monstrous growth has come out out of what was really a comparatively small seed. The more famous Sherlock Holmes became, the more requests Doyle himself received to become a Sherlock Holmes in real life and solve actual cases. Amongst the hundreds of letters, 
there was one about a case which was as mysterious as it was sensational. Immediately, Doyle sought to share it with his own Dr. Watson, his friend and secretary, Alfred Wood. Take a glance at these. What is it? It's about a Mr. Delgy. It seems he has been the butt of a gross miscarriage of justice. Delgy. The case had started three years earlier, near the mining village of Great Worley in the English Midlands, when a pit pony was found slashed and bleeding to death. It was the eighth slashing within six months, the work of an animal, Jack the Ripper. A tip led the police to the local vicarage. The Reverend Didalji was an Indian married to an English woman. Weeks earlier, anonymous letters to the police had pointed the finger at their son, George, who had recently qualified as a lawyer. Police inquiries now resulted in a trial at the Court of Quarter Sessions, where the young Idalji was sentenced to seven years in Lewis Jail. But after serving only three, he was suddenly released without any official explanation. Free, but without a pardon. He wrote to Doyle. As I read, I realized that I was in the presence of an appalling tragedy, and that I was called upon to do what I could to set it right. I got other papers in the case, went up to Great Worley, saw the family, went over to the scene of the crime. Between Idalji's house and the place where the first mutilation was committed lay the full breadth of the London and North Western Railway, an expanse of rails, wires and other obstacles, with hedges to be forced on either side, so that I, a strong and active man in broad daylight, found it a hard matter to pass. Not until I had examined every fact thoroughly, from every angle, did I arrange to question Adalji. The meeting took place at my hotel. Mr. Adalji? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Sir Arthur, this is indeed an honor. Well, you appear to be somewhat short-sighted. Did you leave your glasses behind? My eyesight's so bad that nothing can be done to help me. At his trial, no mention had been made of the fact that Idalji was practically blind. That's very serious. Doyle wrote a series of articles in the Daily Telegraph. He asked how could Idalji slip out of the vicarage without being noticed, either by his family or by any of the six policemen who had the house under surveillance all that night. The police had found footprints at the scene of the crime, and for comparison, they had pressed one of Idalji's boots into the mud. They then produced the mud on the boot as evidence at the trial. Also, his clothes were presented, carrying horse hairs and bloodstains. After the trial was over, the bloodstains were proved to be gravy, and the horse hairs traced to a strip of hide which the police had unthinkingly wrapped up with the clothes. There was a public outcry, and Doyle was invited to a meeting with the Home Secretary. Idalji's name was cleared, but Doyle wasn't finished. He now set out to discover the identity of the real Ripper. Before long, Doyle began receiving anonymous threatening letters, which gave him the clues he needed to track him down. The clues implied that the real culprit was a sailor who had been at school with Adalji. Doyle narrowed it down to a Royden Sharp, who as a schoolboy had had a reputation for writing anonymous letters. With Woody to help him, Doyle traced Sharp's whereabouts and learned that he had indeed been to sea. Apparently he had been trained in a slaughterhouse and showed signs of periodic insanity. Doyle even got hold of the long horse Lancet with which he believed the slashings had been committed. But the police felt that Doyle had been conned by Adalji. His deductions were circumstantial and the police warned him he risked libeling an innocent man. So Royden Sharp was never brought to trial. Yet Doyle's efforts did help to lead to the introduction of a court of criminal appeal in England. Idalji was eventually readmitted by the Law Society, and he left Great Worley to start a new career in the anonymity of London. Meanwhile, Sherlock Holmes was a bestseller. But Doyle felt his stories were trivial, so in 1893 he killed Holmes off. In the final story of the memoirs, Holmes plunged to his death in Switzerland. By the time the story was published, Doyle himself was also in Switzerland. Just before he had written his first Sherlock Holmes story, Doyle had married Louise. 
nicknamed Tui. Now they settled in Davos. Doyle had given up his medical practice and sold their home in England because Tui had contracted TB and only an alpine climate could give her any chance of recovery. That winter, Doyle imported several pairs of Norwegian skis and so became the man who first introduced cross-country skiing to Switzerland. He proved it was possible to cross from one snowbound village to another when he skied 12 miles over a 9,000 foot pass. Such a journey had never been attempted before. Tui's condition gradually improved and Doyle settled down to being a full-time writer. Since his earliest childhood, Doyle's mother had fascinated him with stories of the past. He had been born and grew up in Edinburgh, a city steeped in history, where it was all too easy for the young Doyle to imagine himself in another age. Here he discovered the heroes of Walter Scott, and the days of chivalry came alive in his imagination. All those traditional values of honor, integrity, valor, truth, were incorporated in Doyle's new character, Brigadier Gerard, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars. The publication of the first story coincided with an invitation to visit the United States for a speaking tour. America liked him, and he liked America. But here, as well as everywhere else, the public continued to clamor for the return of Sherlock Holmes. The great detective made his comeback on stage, played by the American actor William Gillette, and speaking for the first time in this early recording, the famous words which Doyle never wrote. Elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. The royalties from the play, and to his steady recovery, allowed them to return to a new home in England. 1897 was Queen Victoria's diamond jubilee. The might of the British Empire was on parade, and Doyle was invited to watch military maneuvers. Doyle had a romantic view of war, but he was soon to discover the reality. For a year later, the troops who had drilled so splendidly in England were on their way to fight the Boers in South Africa. Doyle volunteered to go with them. In a sense, he was running away for he had met and fallen in love with a younger woman, Jean Lecky. But he could not betray Tui. Although emotionally he was in torment, he was determined to remain faithful. He volunteered to serve in a frontline hospital as unpaid senior physician. In the nearby hills, the Boers had captured and cut off the town's water supply, but the generals didn't think it very important. Fever broke out. Supplies and equipment were inadequate. Plagues of flies swarmed round the sick, and the stench could be smelt six miles away. Five thousand men died here. When it was all over, Doyle went into print, criticizing the whole military conduct of the war. Why, he asked, did the artillery draw up as equally spaced targets in the open? Why did officers dress so they could be easily spotted by the enemy? Wasn't shooting more important than drill? Shouldn't the cavalry be armed with rifles rather than swords and lances? And if the youth of Britain were taught how to shoot, could they not immediately form a home guard in time of war? Back in England, Doyle built a rifle range in his garden and at his own expense started training young men from his village. He never stopped short when he believed in something. Also back in England, after a miraculous escape, Sherlock Holmes was investigating the Hound of the Baskervilles. In the wings, Jean was still waiting, but Doyle would not break faith with his marriage vows. Torn between loyalty to Tui and desire for Jean, it was a romantic trial worthy of the days of chivalry. It lasted for ten years, until, in 1906, Tui died. A year later, Doyle married Jean. Principles were important to Doyle. They motivated both his private and his public life. As a candidate for Parliament, he damaged his own chances by supporting a Catholic university for Ireland. He championed reform of the divorce laws. He raised funds for the Olympics. He campaigned against colonial misrule in the Belgian Congo. But above all, like Sherlock Holmes, he fought injustice. His longest case lasted 16 years. 
and had its origins in a Glasgow tenement on a December evening in 1908. The maid had slipped out, double locking the door behind her and leaving 83-year-old Miss Gilchrist alone. The flat below was occupied by Arthur Adams and his two sisters. What on earth was that? You'd better go and see if something's wrong. Oh. Quickly, dear. Yes, 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 yes. Miss Gilchrist. Again, that clothes dryer's iPhone, too. Oh, my God. Nelly, where's your mistress? When the police came to investigate, all that was apparently missing was a crescent-shaped diamond brooch. You see, I'm very short-sighted. Neither Arthur Adams nor Nellie could give a clear description of the intruder. You don't know who it was now, Nellie. Outside, however, a 14-year-old girl claimed to have seen him clearly. A few days later, a pawnbroker reported that he had a diamond crescent brooch. It was traced to an Oscar Slater, who had just left his wife and was heading for a new life in the United States. In Glasgow, he was leaving behind a career of gambling and prostitution, and he had already been suspected of involvement in a killing. The New York police received a cable requesting Slater's immediate arrest. On a following ship, Nellie and the girl in the street traveled together to identify him. The Glasgow police had shown them a photograph of Slater, and by the time they reached New York, their originally very different descriptions tallied exactly. Slater volunteered to return and clear his name. But on the testimony of the two girls, he was found guilty, even though he had pawned the brooch weeks before the murder, and it was quite different from Miss Gilchrist's. Once again, Doyle assumed the role of detective. It is an atrocious story. Why had Nellie expressed no surprise when she walked past the stranger in the hall? Why did the intruder only steal a diamond brooch? Was it perhaps a document, not jewelry they've been after? If so, what kind of document? Will? How had the intruder known where Miss Gilchrist kept her papers and jewelry? The flat was double locked, so the intruder had either let himself in with a key or been let in. Could it be that the man was not a stranger at all? Doyle published his views in 1912 and campaigned for an inquiry. It prompted a Glasgow police detective to privately approach a solicitor. The detective's conscience was troubling him. At the trial, a statement he had taken from a relative of the murdered woman, a Miss Birrell, had not been used. Miss Birrell said, I shall never forget the night of the murder. Miss Gilchrist's servant, Helen Lammy, came to my door at about 7.15. On the door being opened, she rushed into the room and exclaimed, Miss Burrell, Miss Burrell, Miss Gilchrist has been murdered. She is lying dead in the sitting room. And oh, Miss Burrell, I saw who did it. I said, my God, Nellie, this is awful. Who was it? Do you know him? This is the name she gave me. The detective named Miss Gilchrist's nephew, who at the time of the murder had been an impoverished medical student. The detective was promised the protection of the Secretary of State. But when Miss Birrell and Nellie both denied the statement, he was sacked from the force after 21 years service, and Slater stayed in jail. Once Doyle was committed to a cause, he would not let go. But his campaign for Slater was interrupted, for it was now 1914. And when Germany declared war, Doyle was ready with Britain's first trained home guard unit. 
A few months before the outbreak of war, Doyle had published a cautionary tale about a force of eight submarines belonging to a North Sea state who managed to bring Britain to her knees by sinking her merchant shipping and cutting off her supplies of imported food. In his story, neutrals were attacked. A great transatlantic liner went down. Merchantmen zigzagged to avoid torpedoes, and aircraft hunted down submarines. The ideas in his story were poo-pooed by the authorities as utterly unrealistic. No civilized nation would ever wage war in such a way. Yet within the first few weeks of the war, German U-boats had sunk three cruisers, and with them 1,400 British sailors went down. Doyle appeared in print suggesting inflatable rubber life belts. Within a week, they were being manufactured. Why not also inflatable lifeboats, asked Doyle. On land, the death toll in the trenches was even more horrendous. Elementary observations Doyle had made during the Boer War were now sadly borne out. The men needed protection. Doyle remembered Ned Kelly, the Australian bushranger who persistently defied death with his breastplate of steel. Couldn't the British Tommy in the front line be similarly equipped? Doyle started experimenting with body armour and bombarded the press and the authorities with letters and articles. Eventually, the army introduced the steel helmet, but not the bulletproof breastplate. Out of the seven members of Doyle's family who went to the war, only one survived. Jean's brother was also killed. She shared her grief with her closest friend, Lily Loder Simmons, who had lost all three of her brothers in France. Shortly afterwards, Lily started receiving messages from beyond the grave and developed the power of automatic writing. For over 30 years, Doyle had had an interest, albeit somewhat skeptical, in psychic phenomena. Now, through Lily, he himself received a message. Doyle would never reveal more than that it was from his son, but it was so intimately personal that Doyle did not just believe it, he knew it was true. And for the rest of his life, he devoted himself to the cause of spiritualism. His writing, too, began to reflect his interest in the future and the unknown. In stories like The Lost World, he was moving into the realms of science fiction. But every so often he would come back to Sherlock Holmes, and another unusual case would be solved. The last appeared in 1927. And in real life, Doyle himself now came back to the long-standing case of Oscar Slater, who had spent 18 years in Peterhead Jail. Nellie and the other girl suddenly retracted their evidence, and Slater was released. At his own expense, Doyle immediately funded Slater's appeal for compensation. During the 20s, Doyle relentlessly travelled the world to convert others to spiritualism. But by 1929, his health was failing. On the 1st of July, 1930, he met the Home Secretary to lobby for a reform of the laws on witchcraft and vagrancy under which mediums could still be prosecuted. A week later, he died peacefully, surrounded by his family. It was just 100 years ago that Sherlock Holmes first appeared at 221B Baker Street. And ever since, his mailbag has been second only to that of Santa Claus. His American fan club, the Baker Street Irregulars, even issued their own private stamp. The spiritualists also produced a stamp for an international conference in Barcelona. In 1972, Nicaragua issued a stamp as one of a set of 12 commemorating the 50th anniversary of Interpol. And in 1979, Sherlock Holmes appeared again on one of a set issued by the small Italian Republic of San Marino. Holmes and Doyle appeared together in 1980 on this stamp from the Comoro Islands. The latest issues by the Turks and Caicos Islands in 1984 feature Doyle and depict some of Sherlock Holmes' most famous adventures. Publicly, Doyle rarely praised Sherlock Holmes. He wanted to be remembered as a historical novelist and a pioneer of science fiction. But from the moment he created Sherlock Holmes, the two became inseparable. Holmes always got it right. Not so Doyle. He trusted people too much, and often they took advantage of him. But Doyle never counted the cost. Once he committed himself, he was as loyal to ideas as he was to people. Nothing would deflect or dissuade him from his convictions. Even if to the rest of the world, he sometimes seemed like Don Quixote, tilting at imaginary windmills.
He was a knight errant, a champion of values which in the end were both his weakness and his greatness. Stamp of Greatness next Saturday follows the career of John Paul Jones, a man who challenged the might of British sea power with a single ship, and won. That's at the same time of 6.30. Programmes continue this Saturday on 4 with a new summary. That follows in just a moment. <laughs>